Cheerio there. Now, the XPS 13 has been the benchmark in 13 inch laptops for a long time now. They're the ones that started the ultra thin bezels with that infinity edge display. This is a complete new redesign with this XPS 13 9370. So can the XPS 13 retain its title for the best 13 inch ultrabook? Want to order something from the US but they won't take your credit card or ship to your country? You need Big Apple Buddy. It's as easy as one, two, three. Check out the description for a discount code for your first Big Apple Buddy order. So this is my full product review. There'll be time code in the description that's near the like and subscribe button there. There'll also be links to my recommended model. And at the end of this review, there will be all the other reviews I've done comparing it to the MacBook Pro, video editing review, gaming review, and compared to the last model. So this is your one-stop shop for XPS 13, everything you need to know. Now they start at 999 US, and that will get you still a quad core, i5 version with 4 gigabytes of RAM, which is pretty good value considering you're getting a quad core. Now I recommend you get as much RAM as you can, but in Australia here, start at 2099, they start at 1249 quid in the UK. You can get up to Core i7-8550U processors. These are 15 watt parts. They can burst up to four gigahertz, up to 16 gigabytes of low power DDR3 and up to a terabyte of SSD storage. The model I have here is the i5-8250U, eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabyte SSD. And when it comes to build quality, ooh, this thing is damn sexy. It is the sexiest laptop out there when it comes to this rose gold and white model. Alpine white deck there, sandwiched between CNC machined, rose gold aluminium, beautiful. Absolutely pure class. It's very petite, that white woven glass palm rest has a nice texture to it. It's different to the soft touch on the black carbon fiber model. I think it's just top draw when it comes to design there. It is elegant, beautiful. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Now, of course, having those thin bezels means that the webcam is down the bottom in the middle there. So it will look up at you. Now, I've already done the video comparing it to the MacBook Pro it will be tagged on at the end of this video you can check that out I would not be buying a MacBook Pro or anything that's dual core at the moment so you need eighth generation quad core at the moment there's no comparison it is better than the MacBook Pro just because the MacBook Pros have that dual core it's only 11.6 millimeters thin 1.21 kilos 2.68 pounds it is the most petite smallest compact 13 inch out there now one place this differs to the previous generation is you do not get USB-A now and you don't get a full size micro SD card slot. They still sell the old model, so if those things are important to you, maybe you want the old model because you can get the eighth generation quad core in that. So when you go thinner and lighter, you're gonna lose these legacy ports. So on the left hand side, we have two times four Thunderbolt three ports. So plenty of bandwidth there. On the right hand side, we have USB-C and micro SD card slot and a headphone jack. Now the thing about the micro SD card slot, this is one thing that sort of differentiates it from a lot of the new 13 inches out there. I would prefer it's full size. At least you can add additional storage. At least they put that there. You also get included in the box of USB-C to type A adapter there. So at least they include that as well. When it comes to sound, this has good quality sound. Max Audio Stereo 2 times one watt speakers. They are very clean and rich sounding. All sort of ties in with this Dell Cinema. I'll give them a solid 8 out of 10 for sound, but not as good as the MacBook Pros in terms of sound, but getting up there. And it is great to watch, you know, Netflix and etc. on this device, especially with the Infinity Edge display. Now the keyboard is actually new. It's called MagniLeave or something like that. It uses magnets in the keyboard, 1.3 millimeters of travel. So that's a good amount of travel for an Ultrabook. It is strange to use this. I got used to it. It doesn't feel like a normal keyboard. It takes a little bit more force to activate these keys and also when you let off the pressure it sort of has a bit of energy return it sort of pushes your finger up now once you get used to that it's super fast typing with it however i still think it's a good keyboard and it's better than a lot of ultrabooks i can say that for sure the trackpad you know it gets an 8 out of 10 it's one of the better windows trackpads you know but compared to macbook pro trackpad yeah which is a 10 out of 10 it's still not up there but it is a decent trackpad nice and smooth nice click to it it does take a little bit of force to get that click going but um it is a nice trackpad now when it comes to display there are two options 
You have a full HD non-touch option and you have a 4K version with touch. Both are edge-to-edge -edge Gorilla Glass 4 and 100% sRGB. They have the Dell Cinema, so it does really look good. I have the full HD model. As I said, they're both glossy. It's crisp, vibrant, very bright. These things get very bright. Both the displays get very bright. It's nice and contrasty. It is a cracking display. Now, when you get the 4K, that goes to another level that is ultra crisp and sharp but you will get about three hours less battery with that so do you need 4k probably is overkill but if you do want that ultra sharp crisp 4k display that option is there for you but both the displays are actually really awesome so when it comes to battery life it has a 52 watt hour battery has a 45 watt charger i could get nearly 14 hours just streaming youtube videos at 40 percent brightness it's one of the only laptops i would leave just playing videos at night come back in the morning and still be playing those videos not many laptops do that so with this full hd model you will easily get 10 hour run out of it just with normal web surfing etc and with that sort of general use 11 12 hours maybe you know what i mean at you know that 40 percent brightness with the 4k model you'll get around three hours less battery life so around the seven seven and a half hours battery life with the 4k model so whichever way you go you're getting good battery life pretty much class lead in there now when it comes to performance this performs pretty much better than any eighth generation quad core out there at the moment when we're talking the u-series processors it can burst harder for longer and we're talking like over three gigahertz for nearly two minutes in synthetic benchmarks and in normal use it'll burst for even longer because synthetic loads are usually harder on the system it can play your casual games i was even able to play overwatch and fortnite at low settings as you'll see later in the video you know for Football Manager Minecraft, it's perfect for those sort of things. You can actually video edit full HD content, no problem. And with a few tweaks here and there, you can actually edit 4K, although I don't recommend. This is a 4K editing machine, but I will say get the 16 gigs if you can afford it because you cannot upgrade the RAM. The only thing you can upgrade is the M.2 SSD. You can also replace the battery and the Wi-Fi module. So in conclusion, is this still the king of 13-inch Ultrabooks? Well, I would say yes. The water is getting a bit muddy now because there are some Ultrabooks now that are actually putting GPUs in their 13 inch laptops. That sort of muddies the waters a bit. Are they a different class or should I be comparing them to these 13 inches without GPUs? Let me know down there in the comments what you think. But I think when it comes to this white one, it's definitely the sexiest, classiest laptop out there. It's definitely the best performing of these eighth generation quad core CPUs at the moment. Comparing it to its competition, you know macbook pro surface laptop i think it's a better buy definitely i would not be buying those at the moment because they're only dual core we'll have to wait for those laptops to be refreshed but as it stands right now this is the king of 13 inch ultrabooks so what are the cons to this laptop there's not really much to pick on maybe that the full hd is not touch display it is expensive compared to some other ultrabooks and also some other ultrabooks as i said before are putting gpus in their 13 inch laptops but in terms of just pure 13 inch ultra books this is the one to get so i'd like to thank you guys for watching give me a like if you appreciate this video now let's go on to video editing gaming performance and compared to its competition and the last xps 13 now cheerio there champs what is the best 13 inch laptop you can buy at the moment we're talking ultra books here to qualify for this you have to be a thin and light ultrabook with a premium build that's why i ruled out the surface book 2 because at the end of the day it's not that thin and light compared to these laptops well it's actually not that much heavier than the macbook pro but it is a hybrid it is a two-in-one so it's not really a laptop so what is the best 13 inch ultrabook you can buy as of today the actual zenbook is actually a 14 inch it's because it's actually thinner and lighter than the macbook pro so i think if you're in the market for a 13 inch ultrabook this is worth considering too so the three laptops we'll be comparing is the 217 macbook pro 13 inch non-touch 
I will talk about the touch version as well. The ZenBook 3 Deluxe UX 490 UA and the Dell XPS 13 9370. That's the 2018 model. Now, when it comes to price, no surprise here. The Mac is the most expensive. If we spec them up all the same to their higher end models, the Mac will be about 2K for the non-touch version, 2,200 for the touch bar version. You can pick up the ZenBook for around 1,700 US and currently the XPS 13 is 1,900 for this high spec configuration with the 4K display. In terms of build quality, they are all top draw here. They all get full marks for premium design, premium materials. It's going to come down to personal preference which one you like better in terms of aesthetics. I just love the XPS 13 with the white interior. That is just so sexy. They're all beautiful. They're all constructed to the highest standard possible. These are pretty much all the benchmark when it comes to fit and finish and build quality. So let me know in the comments actually which one do you prefer? Which one do you like the look of? I'd really like to know that. Leave a comment down there. It's right near the like button and if you're new around here please subscribe. When it comes to specs, okay, so the MacBook Pro is using dual core processors, the seventh generation dual core processors, so it is a generation behind the ZenBook and the XPS 13, which use the eighth generation quad core parts. They all have a maximum of 16 gigabytes RAM. The MacBook and the XPS 13, you can get up to one terabyte SSD, and with the ZenBook, you can get up to 512 gigabyte SSD. The MacBook Pro's SSD is soldered in, the other two have upgraded SSDs, M.2 SSDs. ZenBook and XPS 13 have Intel HD graphics. The MacBook Pro has Iris graphics. I do expect that the XPS 13 will eventually come out with Iris graphics also. ZenBook Pro has a 46 watt hour battery. MacBook Pro has a 54 0.5 watt hour battery and that's the non-touch version which has the bigger battery compared to the touch version. The XPS 13 has a 52 watt hour battery so the Mac actually does have the biggest battery out of all of them and the ZenBook the smallest. When it comes to weight the ZenBook is the lightest at 1.1 kilos the MacBook Pro is the heaviest at 1.37 kilos. That's a fair bit of difference there. The XPS 13 is in the middle, 1.21 kilos. So the XPS 13 is the thinnest at 11.6 millimeters. The MacBook Pro is the thickest at 14.9 millimeters and the ZenBook 3 is 12.9 millimeters in the middle. Overall, the XPS 13 is the smallest. It's the most compact. It really is the size of an 11 inch laptop. The ZenBook is the lightest. The MacBook is the heaviest and it's the thickest and that's really interesting because I think even when they revise these MacBook Pros they're going to keep the same chassis so I don't think they're going to go any thinner and lighter so it is at the heavier and thicker end of this 13 inch segment here so in terms of specs of course the ZenBook and the XPS 13 have the better specs because they have that eighth generation quad core part it is much faster than the dual core seventh generation CPU you get in the Mac. When it comes to ports, they're all very similar. MacBook Pro has two Thunderbolt ports on the non-touch, four Thunderbolt ports on the touch version, that's Thunderbolt 3. The ZenBook has two Thunderbolt 3 ports and one USB-C port. The XPS 13 has two Thunderbolt 3 ports and one USB-C port. Now all the Thunderbolt ports are times four Thunderbolt ports, but the extra thing that the XPS 13 has is it does have a micro SD card slot. So that is handy. You know, you can even put video files on there if you're video editing, you can put photos, whatever. It's just expandable storage. Or, you know, if you have a camera that has micro SD, you can plug that in and take the files off that. I have to give it to the XPS 13 there just because of that. When it comes to sound, this is very easy. The Mac has the best sound, 10 out of 10. The ZenBook has a very good sound. I'd give that 9 out of 10. And the XPS 13 has very good sound as well. I'll give that about an 8 out of 10. When it comes to keyboard and trackpad, I think that's easy to judge as well. The Mac definitely has the best trackpad, 10 out of 10. I'd say the XPS 13 has the next best trackpad. I'll give that an 8 out of 10. And the ZenBook Deluxe would have maybe a 7.5 out of 10 trackpad. It's not quite as good as the XPS 13s. When it comes to keyboard, you can sort of flip that around. The Mac, I don't like the Mac keyboard. It is a bit shallow. Some people love it, so you will have to try these keyboards, but it's too jarring and shallow for me. I think the XPS 13 has the best keyboard, followed closely by the ZenBook. So when it comes to display, now this is hard. So we'll just 
judge them on their best display. The MacBook only comes with one display. It's 2560 by 1600 wide color gamut P3. It's non-touch 13.3 inch 16 by 10 ratio. So it is a bit taller than both the ZenBook and the XPS 13. The XPS 13 comes with a full HD model that is non-touch. It is a good display, 100% sRGB. It's non-touch as I said, and it also has the option of a 4K display, 100% sRGB, and that one is touch. The ZenBook only comes with one display, 100% sRGB, full HD display, and that is 14 inch. 16 by nine ratio, the same as the XPS 13, but it is the biggest screen. So here you're gonna to have to work out what do you need. The best two displays, I think, are the 4K on the XPS 13 and the Mac display. The Mac has that wider color gamut, so it does have the widest color gamut. The Mac and the XPS 13 brightness is around the same. If you're doing like, say, desktop publishing or printing or stuff like that, the Mac does have the widest color gamut. But if you're just talking overall better display, I think the XPS 13 has the best display. What you get with a 4K screen on a 13 inch laptop, it does look like overkill, but you get a sharper image. You know this when you have a phone. When you have a 1080p phone versus a uh, 2k phone, you'll notice that the higher resolution phone does have a sharper image. The 4K display on the XPS 13 is sharper than the Mac display. They are both phenomenal quality. The XPS 13 also does have touch, but the Mac has the wider color gamut. Let me know what you think is the better display. That's what I would say. It will depend on your usage, but overall, considering touch, 4K bright screen, I think the XPS shades it here over the Mac, although out of those two, you can't really go wrong. They are both cracking displays, and remember the Mac's display is a little bit taller. Now the ZenBook 3 Deluxe display is very good. Make no mistake, it is full HD. It is the biggest display because it is 14 inch, 100% sRGB, so respectable color gamut there. It is a beautiful display, no doubt about it, but the Mac and the XPS do have the better display when it comes to the high-end display on the XPS 13 and the Mac, every Mac gets the same display. So they are better than the ZenBooks display. So let me know down there in the comments again, which display would you prefer? When it comes to battery life, the Mac does have the biggest battery, but if you're talking just the best battery life, it's actually the XPS 13 with the full HD display. That has 10 hours battery life. I was able to get nearly 14 hours just running YouTube continuously. You'll get, for general web surfing and stuff like that, you will get in excess of 10 hours. MacBook Pro does have the biggest battery. Your nine to 10 hours you'll get out of the MacBook Pro, the non-touch version, the touch version you'll get less. Now, if you put the 4K display on the XPS 13, the battery life on the Mac is better. It's probably about an hour better, but they're very close once you have the high-res display on the XPS 13 versus the standard display that comes with the Mac. They're very similar, but if you want like really long battery life, you have the choice of the Full HD on the XPS 13. With the ZenBook, you're only gonna get six, seven hours battery life because it does have the smallest battery. But these are the compromises that you have to make. It is the thinnest and lightest. So six, seven hours, I think is okay. Are you willing to sacrifice, you know, battery life for something that's thin and light? Some people do. Again, let me know in the comments, would you prefer a bigger laptop, fatter, with better battery life, or would you like thinner and a bit less battery life? These are the decisions that the manufacturers have to make, and this is what they come up with. So in terms of performance, no doubt the ZenBook and the XPS 13 are of a magnitude faster than the MacBook Pro just because they are quad cores versus dual cores on the MacBook Pro. They should update the MacBook Pros this year, but I wouldn't hold your breath, but I think they will. Do not buy a dual core seventh generation MacBook Pro 13 inch now. Wait for the quad cores. The Macs, they do throttle anyway because their thermal design is not very well. So you don't get the maximum performance anyway. And once they put quad cores in there, unless they upgrade the cooling solution, they're gonna throttle anyway. So you probably won't get the performance that you get with the ZenBook and the XPS 13. They have identical CPUs. So you would think that the performance is identical, but it's not. The XPS 13 has the best tuned quad core going around. The 15 watt eighth generation quad core in the XPS 13 goes harder for longer and it actually can burst over three gigahertz for nearly two minutes. Whereas the one in the ZenBook will only do that for you know roughly 40 seconds and then it will drop down to 2.2, 2.4. And the temperatures are low on the ZenBook, like they're only 60, maybe maximum 70, but the clock speed is, you know, it's not that high. Whereas the XPS 13, 
the clock speeds are consistently higher. Now it does produce more heat, but you won't feel that heat because it has this core technology, this space age insulation technology inside the XPS 13, where you do not feel the heat on your lap. It's amazing, like you feel the underneath and you think, how is this 80, 90 degrees inside? Now the reason it is hotter is because it's got a higher clock speed, but you don't feel that. So it's really well tuned, the Dell, the Mac, dual cores, and it does throttle. So the best performance is the XPS 13, followed by the ZenBook and the MacBook Pro is like way behind, really. It is far behind. When it comes to upgradability, the only ones you can upgrade are the ZenBook Pro and the XPS 13 where you can actually upgrade the M.2 SSD. All of these laptops have soldered in RAM, so you cannot upgrade the RAM. So I do recommend you get the highest capacity of RAM that you can afford on any of these laptops. So in conclusion, what is the best 13 inch Ultrabook? you can buy today. First, please let me know what you think. I really want to know. But me personally, I have to go to the XPS 13, shock horror. Considering it does have the best performance out of all these laptops, I think arguably the best display out of all these laptops. It certainly has class leading battery life. It is the most compact out of all of them. It is tiny. You will not believe that it has a 13 inch display. So overall, I have to give it to the XPS 13, followed by the ZenBook, that would be my second choice, and that's just because it's got the quad core. If it didn't have the quad core, I'll probably choose the Mac second, just because of its display. Again, if they had a bit of display in the ZenBook, I probably would choose that second if everyone had the same CPU. The MacBook Pro, the thing is, it's a bit heavier and bulkier than all of them. It's just, it looks like it needs a refresh in terms of design. The design looks fine. It's just thicker, heavier, and bigger than anything else it's compared to like these two laptops so it does sort of look a bit cumbersome but it is still a great laptop but do not buy the dual core wait for the refresh and then maybe i'll do another shootout i'd like to thank you guys for watching give me a thumbs up if you like this video and if you're new around here please subscribe and until next time guys Righto, now let's see if the Dell XPS 13 9370 is any good for video editing. One of the most common questions I get asked other than what game does it play and so I dedicate a whole video just to video editing. I will be using Premiere because that's what I use. So if you're definitely interested in this XPS 13 make sure you subscribe. One stop shop here and I have a lot of other great content coming out so watch out for that. Also if you have any questions leave them down there in the comments. I will get back to you. I do read all my comments so I think I deserve a like for that. Nevertheless let's get into this. So this model here is the i5 8 gigabytes of RAM. So let's see does it handle SD content? And what I will say is definitely get the 16 gigabytes RAM if you're thinking about video editing. Eight gigabytes is not enough. I'll just show you a little video here. When I rendered a 4K project, which I used to test rendering times, it was hitting that hard drive like hard because it ran out of memory. Eight gigabytes of memory, it's not enough. So definitely get 16 gigs if you're interested in video editing. This here is just standard definition content look here for this green dot if you're looking on the phone you may have to get a bigger screen but you may be able to see this green dot where i'm hovering over here once that turns yellow we are dropping frames okay so this is standard definition let's play it and apologize for the planes again okay it'll play through standard definition at oh that's half we'll turn that to full okay it'll play standard definition at full no problems so standard definition you're covered I'll just do this little test how many streams I can do okay three streams no problem doesn't drop frames so standard def you're covered now I will open a, a 4k project and I will close it just because this is an 8 gig model with an i5 I don't want to waste any memory so I will reopen a project instead of having two sequences open at the same time. It's 4K, okay, it has color correction. And as you'll see, a 13 inch laptop with no graphics card. It is a bit choppy, okay? So you, this is the difference, okay? An XPS 15 will play this at full with all these color corrections, these high resolution photos. No problem, because that has a graphics card, four gigabyte, 1050. Now, the MacBook Pro, 
15 inch, I would have to drop that down to half to make it play. 13 inch, there's no hope of making this play. So I just play it. As you can see, it drops frames straight away and you'll see it looks a bit choppy, right? Doesn't look smooth, well, it's not that bad. Actually, through the photos, it won't look too bad. But once you get to the color corrected footage, which is here, you can see it looks like frame by frame, it's choppy. So I know for a fact that really to get a editable playback, you need quarter 4K content, okay? So we'll just play that again. Now it is still dropping frames, but it is, you know, nearly smooth enough to edit like this at quarter. It is still a bit choppy, but it's manageable. It's not the best experience, but hey, it doesn't have a graphics card at one eighth. Okay, a bit smoother again. And what does that look like, that one eighth? Yeah, it doesn't look that great. But um, it is pretty smooth at one eighth. I will go back and I will put that on one quarter again. Play that back. And you'll see it's pretty smooth at one eighth. I mean, sorry, one quarter. That's editable. And um, I'll just go here and scrub, scrub a bit. You know, it's not super fast, but that is manageable at one quarter. 4K, that's with color correction, high resolution photos. You can do it. It's not the best experience, but where this excels is really at full HD content. But it actually can play back 4K content too. I will show you. Now, a lot of people will think Final Cut will play back this 4K content. I'll just delete this. Um, that is the color correction. That was an adjustment layer. So I'll just see if it plays it at real time now. And as you'll see, without the color correction, it can play at a quarter without dropping frames. All right, see if we can go to half. Now, typically you do the color correction at the end. So this won't really be an issue. Again, at half, it'll play back 4K content, no problem, without the color correction. The color correction is what kills it. And let's see if we can play it back at full. I don't think so. There you go, drops frame straight away. We'll just go back, check it again. I mean, there will be a bit of caching, but I still think it will drop frames. Nope, we're not dropping. That's probably just caching. Uh, I'll just delete this other one. See how long it lasts. Okay. So if it's going to drop frames, we'll start dropping now. Plays it at full. Wow. That's pretty good. Oh, there you go. Started dropping frames there. So played it at full for a while. You know, if you want to edit 4K, you could definitely, I think, put it at half if you've got no color correction. We'll just have a look here. Half. Oh, drop some frames again. So yeah, 4K, probably not the best tool, but I think it's manageable without color correction, maybe on half, with it on quarter. Now you might think, well, in Final Cut, if I have a 4K video, it'll play back no problems. And the reason being is I will show you what Final Cut does. People think it's some sort of magic optimization that Apple does with their hardware. That's just a myth, actually. So what Final Cut does is it basically um, uncompresses the files, okay? So when you import a file into Final Cut, automatically it'll render it out in the background, uncompress it, and change it to ProRes, okay? So when you're getting smooth playback with Final Cut, 
it's actually doing that for you, okay? Now with Premiere Pro, it's a professional application. Like Final Cut is more for prosumers, so it does a lot of things for you just without you knowing. Like Premiere will never do that. But anyway, so this is 4K. Now I've rendered this out into Cineform, which is very similar to ProRes. And let's see, actually, I know that it will be able to play this at full, no problem. And boom, it does. So basically, when you hear people saying, well, that 4K content, I can edit it with my MacBook Pro 13 inch 4K content, no problem. Well, that's the reason why, because it's actually converting it to Cineform in the background. There's no magic, you know, optimization or whatever it's just that's what it does and if you do that manually yourself as i just did there it'll play back that content at full so in actual fact if you done best practice and actually converted your footage to say cineform or even prores and then imported it into premiere this could edit 4k content no problem without fuss okay when you had the color corrections at the end yes it'll probably start struggling then but 4K content, if it's converted to Cineform or ProRes or something like that, it'll edit 4K. But straight out of your camera, it's not the best for 4K because it's very compressed. has to uncompress that footage. You know, powerhouse laptops like the XPS 15, they won't worry. They'll still be able to actually play through all this full compression there, full res, 4K with color corrections, but um, not a 13 inch without a graphics card okay so let's see how she does with a uh, full hd content so this is h.264 typical of what you would get out of a phone or a camera it is compressed it hasn't been uncompressed like to cineform or you know a prores or anything like that we have it on full and we'll see how it plays through it and as you'll see this thing can video edit um, full hd content no problems I'll talk about rendering times in a minute. But with 4K, it could play 4K at half. could play it even at full without any effects, maybe for a little bit. If you uncompressed it to Cineform or to uh, ProRes, you could edit 4K. And if you put it to an external hard drive, like a fast SSD, and connected it to that and uncompressed it to Cineform or ProRes again, um, you would be able to edit 4K content, but not many people do that. They just take their, you know, their raw file out of the um, camera and put it on the machine, and it's not going to be able to do that. It doesn't have a video card. Laptops with graphics cards, they can do that, no problems, but uh, not ones without it. So, as you can see there, it will not drop frames with 1080p content. So, what I'll do here, we'll see if it will play those streams simultaneously. We'll see, can it play back all those streams um, at full and not drop frames? Oh, look at that. Four full HD streams, no problem. So, editing full HD is not an issue at all. I just mentioned if you want to edit 4K, how to do it. Um, Best practice is always to uncompress, convert to um, Cineform or whatever. I've already shown that it can play through high resolution photos when I was in that 4K project before. All right, finally, now let's add some transitions and a bit of color correction, see how we go there. All right, cross dissolve, one there, yeah, whatever. Um, one there, and one here. Okay, see if it plays through those transitions. Watch out for the green light there. Will it go yellow? Of course, full HD content, no problem as usual. It's playing that back at full. I'm going to hit the transition. Three, two, one. Let's go. Straight through, straight through that transition at full, no problems. See if we can go through the second one. And here we go. Second one, no problem. So it has no problems with transitions. 
We'll do a bit of color correcting. Full HD, it will scrub like a champ. So smooth. All right, let's try and do some color correcting it. See what it does then. Let's go to color. Or oh, just, I don't know, load. Instead of loading a lot, I'll just mess around with the color. We'll say we want to increase and load the blacks. Bit of contrast, bit of saturation. Um, sharpen her up a little bit. And let's see how we go. Okay, so finally it is killed. Color correction. It's not going to do with this XPS 13. It's just not going to happen. Now let's see at half if it's any good. So color correction you usually do last anyway. At half it has no problems playing the color corrected clip back. So there you have it I guess. That's pretty good. I'll just copy those settings. Okay, so we'll just color, uh, just copy in the um, the color corrections on each of them. And if I do play that at full, it's not going to work. Obviously, we've already established that. But how is it scrubbing like that? Seems okay scrubbing like that, and it's not playing them at real time. You can see it's dropping frames. It's not as smooth as it should be. But um, it's still editable. Editable. It still is. Even at full. But for best, I would go half after color correction. Yeah, nice and smooth scrub in there. Nice smooth playback. Half is the way to go, and half is what I usually use on a laptop anyway, even though the XPS 15 can pretty much play content with color correction and so on. I usually put it at half because it's just super smooth that way. And at the end, I'll put it at full. Boom, there you go. This can video edit, standard definition, full HD, 4K, not the best, especially if it's compressed. If you want to work on the files, uncompress them, put them on external hard drives, as I said before, yep, no problems. You will be able to edit 4K content, but it's not going to be the best. Okay, you need a graphics card. i5 versus i7. I would say that really doesn't matter, but you do want the 16 gigs RAM because it will start right into the disk when you render if you only have 8 gigabytes. Especially with a 4K project, full HD not so much, but 4K definitely it will hit the RAM limit and it will start managing right into the disk and it will just slow down the render time. So you need the 16 gigs if you want to video edit. I just recommend 16 gigs full stop. Now in terms of render times, I didn't want to use the 4K project which I use on all my laptops to compare because as I said it was hitting that um, RAM issue where it didn't have enough RAM. So I just rendered out a two minute video and I compared it to the dual core seventh generation to this one and more or less it stands up to that 40% faster than the dual core. So this will also depend on effects, if how many photos you have, um, color correction and stuff like that. But generally that 40% over the last generation dual cores will sort of stand up most of the time. So I think this XPS 13 is as good as you're gonna get in a 13 inch laptop without a graphics card for video editing. So just bear in mind all those things I said before about 4K, oh, I wouldn't use it for 4K, but I mean, you can do it. So I'd like to thank you guys for watching. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video. If there's any questions, leave them down there in the comments. I will answer you. And until next time, cheerio. Okay, so today we're gonna have a look at the differences between the Dell XPS 13, 93, 60 versus the 9370. Both have H generation 15 watt quad core CPU parts here. In actual fact, this one has the i5, this one has the i7, but you'll see later, interestingly, 
is in benchmarks, this is actually faster than that. We'll get to that later. If there's any test or anything you want me to do with this 9370, the new XPS 13, uh, let me know down there in the comments any questions. I will do a full review, gaming review, video editing review. I'm just your one-stop shop for this XPS 13. So first thing is you'll see there's a color difference. New Dell logo, okay, it's a thinner font. That's the old Dell logo. This is gold, obviously, that's silver. They used to have a gold XPS 13. I don't know if they still do with the older model, but um, this one is the new Alpine white and gold. So it's a two-toned laptop there. And let me tell you now, this thing is gorgeous, like super gorgeous. Now, just looking at them, they look fairly similar. You can see that this one's not quite as tall as that one, it looks like. Just a millimeter here and there, the footprint. It's just a shave mill here, a shave mill there. Now this is certainly thinner. So this is 11.6 millimeters versus 15 millimeters with the old model. So it is definitely slimmer. The overall footprint, shaved mill here or there, there's not that much difference in the overall footprint, but it's definitely thinner. Now overall, the design is very similar, but this, New XPS 13 just looks more refined, okay? In every way, it just looks more refined. It just looks classier. As you can see here, no service flap, and it has the big vent there. The cooling is a lot better on this new one. So in essence, although this design is very similar, the new one just looks like it's you know, it's been to the gym, it's trimmed off, it's gone on a diet, it just looks, overall it just looks more polished, more refined, and you can definitely tell the difference. I can at least. And you can see that at the side there, when you look at them side on, it is indeed thinner. Now interestingly, it's not really that much lighter, certainly in the non-touch variant here. So both of these have the full HD display, and they're around the same weight when it's the full HD display, 1.2 kilos versus 1.21. This is actually slightly heavier. But when you go for the non-touch, the old one is 1.29 kilos and the new one is 1.21 kilos. So it is lighter if you get the touch version. Overall handling both of them, I can feel that the new one is thinner. As I said, the weight's very similar, so it doesn't feel lighter at all, obviously, but it feels a little bit better to handle. And again, it just looks more polished, more refined, just it looks classier, especially with this gold and white. Now, the one of the main differences is the port situation. So here we have a USB-C micro SD card slot versus full size SD card slot and USB type A on this side. You turn them around, you have two four times Thunderbolt ports on the new XPS 13. You have a Thunderbolt 3 port on the old XPS 13, times two lane, it's not a four times, and you have another USB Type A 3 there. And both of them have a headphone jack. This new one's not going to be for everyone. My personal opinion is much sexier. I do like it, but if you're someone that's never used a USB Type C laptop, think hard and long. You do get a dongle with this new one. It will annoy you to have to use dongles. It certainly annoys me. I understand when things get thinner, these legacy ports will have to go. But if you're just buying it as a tool and you don't care about the thinness and stuff like that, and you just want the ports, the old one is probably for you. And they sell both of them and there's around a $200 price difference at the moment. And they both, as I said, have the eighth generation quad core parts. And as you'll see here, both the speakers are on the side here too. The sound on the new one is better. No doubt it is better. I wouldn't say it's class leading in terms of sound, but the sound is very high quality. Okay, so once I open these bad boys up, you can see the difference. Ebony Ivory. So this is an actual nightmare to film because exposing for black and white and they're completely two different exposures so tried to balance it as best i could i love this white it is so gorgeous this alpine white this is the traditional black that you get with the normal xps 15 this the silver and it has that soft touch this has woven glass and it is a hard touch but it's textured too 
So this does feel more comfortable, but it gets a lot of fingerprints in that. This, I do love the feel of it. I just keep on touching it. I love the texture of it. I, it's really nice, um, but it's not as comfortable as that, but it doesn't show the fingerprint. So 100%, not even a competition for me. I'll take the white every day of the week. Some other differences you'll notice is the trackpad. Well, this one feels slightly smoother. Um, maybe it's because it's new. They're both glass, but the click feels, the click certainly feels better on the new one. So I do like the trackpad on this a bit better. Tracking, very similar. If anything, this one's better. Keyboard, this is backlit white keyboard, white light. So depending on which angle, it may be hard to see, but I don't care. White out is good for me. I love things whited out. Um, You'll see the backlight better on this, obviously. So when it comes to keyboards, the feel of them, this new one uses magnets. They're both 1.3 millimeters travel. So the travel definitely feels similar, but this is a better keyboard for me. Now this will be personal preference. It feels stiffer. That could be because it's new. We'll see how it goes after a week or so, but um. It just feels like you have to apply a bit more pressure to activate these keys. And it just feels better. The feedback feels better, whereas these ones are, feel a bit softer. Um, they, I know, they feel a bit mushy compared to this one. These ones feel firmer. So I definitely like the new keyboard better. Fingerprint scanner here on the old model. On the new model, you have the fingerprint scanner here. Um, I actually prefer it there, but I don't, whatever. You can charge this on any side, USB-C charger, charge it on the left side, right side, doesn't matter. This one has the barrel charger and of course you can only charge it on that side. I think you can charge through Thunderbolt with the old model but it's like really slow. Webcam, in the middle now, infrared scanner for Windows, hello. Uh, here is the webcam on the old model, much better position but they're still at the bottom. That bothers some people, it doesn't even bother me at all but um, like... You probably see a lot of my reviews. I don't even mention the webcam because I really couldn't give a toss, to be honest. So anyway, um, yeah, so it's in the middle and they're both at the bottom. So if that bothers you, yeah, factor that in. Bezels, if we look at the displays, matte display, full HD, glossy display, um, full HD, both non-touch. You can get a QHD on this model and you can get a 4K model on this one. Now they both touch those ones, the QHD and the 4K model. Obviously they are better displays than these two. If you look at them, the brightness looks similar, but this one's at 60%, that's at 100% because this gets a lot brighter. I'll turn up the brightness later, but before I do that, we'll just talk about the bezels. You can see they're slightly thinner on the new model, if you can see that. Also what you'll notice is this has edge to edge glass, Gorilla Glass covering the bezel, so there's no lip here. This has a matte bezel and there's no glass covering it, so there's actually a lip between this and the actual display. There's actually a lip there and it's also matte, as I said there, matte display, gloss display. You can see it's slightly taller because those bezels are a bit bigger on the older model. We're talking few mils here and there but yeah it is still thicker so as I said when it comes to displays this is much better than that it's just much more vibrant and punchy and part of that is because it's glossy but it's also a lot brighter and they have something called Dell Cinema I was watching like some Netflix on this and they mess around with the blacks and whatever the highlights and that it's not HDR but the content really looks good on this when I was watching a movie I was watching uh, Marcella like a sort of gritty sort of crime, UK crime show. And yeah, it looked really good on this. So it does look a lot better on this than it does on that. And I'll just show you how much brighter this gets. Okay, let's turn up the brightness. So now they're both at 100%, as you will see down here, 100%. 100% okay much brighter okay the whites look better the color just pops more and they're both full HD the gloss is better I do like the gloss better of course you're not going to get as much reflections with this one but 
I'll take this any day, no problems. Okay, so when it comes to performance between the two, you'd think eighth generation, that would be the same, right? Well, you'd be wrong because I'll just lower down the display brightness on this one. So they're around the same. Okay, so what you'll see is this has 686 and this is an i5 and this has 624 and it's an i7, both eighth generation CPUs. And that's because this can burst harder for longer. During the whole Cinebench test, this never dipped below three gigahertz. This one here would dip to about 2.5, 2.8, something like that. So the fact that this can burst harder for longer, that cooling is really efficient, okay? Even though the internal temps seem very similar, it just can burst harder for longer because they know keeping those clock speeds up, it's actually gonna stay cooler than this at the same clock speed. So that cooling and that Gore-Tec that it has inside, that space age uh, insulation really works on this. So this performs better. i5 beats an i7 of the same CPU generation. Unbelievable, well-tuned Dell. So I guess at the end of the day, which one should you buy? Which one should you buy? Considering that is cheaper, they both use the same processors. Everything is better on this, okay? It's thinner, it just looks classier, it's more polished, more refined. Everything is better except for the ports, okay? It has a better display, the webcam's in a better position, the keyboard's better, everything is better. You even get better performance, better thermals, better, 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 better. The only thing this has going for it is it's cheaper and it has more ports. So at the end of the day, it's gonna come down to, do you need the port or do you want a bit of savings versus do you want the better machine? That's how I see it. My opinion, I really do, I really do hate not having ports, okay? I do, and I do like to save money, but I don't care. You give me a white laptop or, you know, two-tone white laptop, I don't even like gold. To be honest, I wish it was silver on the top as well. But um, you give me something white, I'll buy it. And I'll put up with the pain. I'll moan about it, but I'll put up with the pain. And this thing is just super sexy, super refined. And I'll give up the ports, especially when you're talking 13 inch, okay? If it's a 15 inch, a different story, because you know I have to video edit, I'll need an SD card slot, blah, blah, blah. With a 13 inch, it's more for like just doing normal tasks for me, like a little bit of gaming, web surfing, email, watch some content, etc. I'm not gonna be doing heavy duty stuff where I need to plug everything into it and that. So I'll get away with that, the ports on this, although it will annoy me. Give me white, I'll take it any day. And it is better. In every department, it's better, other than it's more expensive and that doesn't have the ports so that's what it comes down to if you need the ports get the old one and if you want to save some money get the old one otherwise this is the one okay now i will be doing a lot of reviews on this so make sure you subscribe i'd like to thank you guys for watching give me a thumbs up if you like this video leave down there any questions in the comments section i will answer everything and follow me on twitter for updates on it so until next time guys cheerio Now let's see how the Dell XPS 13-9370 games. Now this particular model here, i5, 8 gigabytes of RAM. The i5 is a quad core. Of course, it does not have discrete graphics. So this isn't really a gaming laptop, but it can actually play casual games fairly well. Now, first of all, straight off the bat, you cannot play AAA titles. You'll see in the background here, I'm playing PUBG, 720p, lowest settings, and it's still not playable. You won't even get up to 30 frames. You might get around 20, 25 frames. It's not meant for these type of games. It's meant for, you know, casual games, Minecraft, Football Manager, Ashfeld 8, and actually plays CSGO, Fortnite, and Overwatch 
Maybe not Fortnite. Fortnite it's touch and go, but certainly I had a good game and experience with Overwatch at 720p low settings. It looked all right still, and it was very playable. With CSGO 1080p low settings, I was able to get well in excess of 60 frames per second. It didn't really get hot. It didn't overheat. It was still bursting in the high 2000s, even up to an excess of 3000 megahertz. So it's a competent little gamer for, you know, casual games. And the good thing is it doesn't get that hot. You won't feel it get that hot underneath and temperatures were well controlled and it wasn't that loud. So let's go into some live gameplay. If you don't like that sort of thing, you know, click off now. I think I deserve a like for playing Fortnite. Like I haven't recovered from that, but give me a like there and subscribe if you're new around here. Let's go into the gameplay. I am doing what no man should have to do. You slap that like button now because I and suffering the pain of playing Fortnite. Nobody should have to do this. But there's plenty of people willing to do it. Oh, jump. I'll oh, jump with them. Hello. Where am I going? Where am I going? What am I doing? All right. So 720p um, low settings. That's what we're doing here. We can see 72, 74 degrees, 2.5 gigahertz or 2600 megahertz. We're getting 60 frames per second. Okay, so very playable. Uh, what do I do? I have no idea. These people are going to kill me, aren't they? Oh no! Get away! Run away! I'll go to a house, see if I can get some guns or something. I have no idea what I'm doing. Please forgive me. I shouldn't have to be doing this. Okay. What do I got? Oh, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. It's very playable, I must say. It looks okay at 720 even. I don't know, it looks like a console, sort of. If you ask me, there's got to be someone in here. I'm a bit scared. All right, so let's go. It's not a gaming laptop, so that's one thing to know, but you can play your casual games. Um, Overwatch, you'll be able to play 720p, it's low settings, and it's very playable, actually. I enjoyed playing Overwatch on this. I'm not enjoying this. Look at that. Oh, we've got up to 80 frames per second there. Um, I'm in the squad, obviously. I'm not enjoying playing this. I, I'm not going to lie. I'm really suffering. Oh, no, he's going to kill me. Oh, put, put me out of my misery. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's playable. That's all you need to know. All right, so now we are playing CSGO. Uh, 1080p. Uh, low settings there. And very playable. Nearly 80 frames per second. Nice and smooth. Uh, it's not getting too hot, 75 degrees, it's over 3 gigahertz, look at that. It is flying. So very playable this game, no problem whatsoever. You'll be very happy playing CSGO on this. And it's really hard to play this far away actually. Oh, oh, oh damn it, my mouse, oh no, cannot believe it. Ouch. Very playable. Oh, he got nailed. <laughs> Who nailed him? God, we both can't shoot. How bad is that? Hey, I'm three meters away. It's very hard. Oh, got a no scope, this dude. I've got no hope. Oh, hello. Very playable, all I'll say. Very playable. Very happy with how this plays Counter Strike, and you will be too. 
Fans aren't too loud. Oh, give me a gun. I don't want to... Oh, hello. Okay, now we're playing Overwatch, uh, 720p low settings. Telemetry is on the top left hand corner, and as you'll see, very playable. Look, 90 frames per second. Are you joking? You probably raise the settings up a bit there, but you probably don't want to because when you get into a bit of action, it will slow down a bit. It looks fine, it looks like a console to me. 720p isn't that bad, and even though it is low settings, this sort of game, this sort of cartoonish sort of game, it still looks okay. Look, 84 frames. This character rules because he requires no skill whatsoever. You just new tube your way to like these massive kill streaks and you don't have to do anything. You just lay down that turret, pop in some new tubes. It's actually a really good character. I like it. So it's actually very interesting, you can actually play this. I would say it's very playable, it's one of the more playable games and it's a very enjoyable game, it's much better than Fortnite if you ask me. So you just lay down that turret, just keep on pounding and you just clean up. I go on massive kill streaks with this dude. It's so good and the other people must be raging so hard because takes no skill, no skill required. But as you can see, 74 degrees, 2.5 gigahertz at the moment, or 2.3, over 60 frames per second. There was a lot of action there, and it still was hitting 60 frames per second, so that's good. Very enjoyable gameplay there. We'll just leave it on for a bit more. And as you can see, it's only using 600 megabytes video memory and overall system memory, 6.5 gigs. So I would recommend you get 16 gigs, even if you're not a gamer or whatever. Just if you can afford it, get the 16 gigs. It's the best way to go. And I was actually enjoying this very much, playing this. So... Fortnite, bit of touch and go. Doesn't it looks terrible Fortnite when you put it on low setting 720p, but um, this one actually looks decent. Okay, new tube your way to success here. Such a great character. Oh, what are you doing? And look at that. Still in excess of 60 frames. Well in excess. Okay, we'll wrap it up here. So for Football Manager, this laptop is perfect. Great for playing Football Manager. Um, I just left it on the default settings, which will be 1080p, of course. And I left it on a 3D engine, and just it's very fast, so it goes through everything really quickly. Uh, give overall talk. Let's see. Yeah. Well, don't worry, man. Let's just go. Boom, 1080p, no problems, let's go baby. Nice and smooth actually, pretty good. Doesn't get hot, that's the good thing about this laptop. Underneath, that Space Age um, insulation, that Gore technology, doesn't matter the temperatures on the inside, the inside's 74, that's, which is perfectly acceptable. We're getting 3.4 gigahertz, over 3 gigahertz, look at it. 3.4, amazing that it even burst that far. But um, you will not feel it on your lap warm. So it's actually very good for these type of games like your Civilization, your Football Manager, Minecraft, you know, your casual games, Asphalt 8. And look, you can play CSGO as well, as I showed before. No problem, 60 frames per second, 1080p with the low settings. But heavy duty AAA titles, just forget about it. It's not a gaming laptop, it's not what it's meant for. But look at it, it's bursting, 3.4 gigahertz there. Wow, and it's only 70 something degrees. So it's got plenty of power 
for a laptop without, you know, discrete graphics. Come on, United. Marshall. Shoot. Yes, baby. Go.